Hello, everyone, and welcome today to our webinar on the first geoportal of migratory austral geese. And we are so excited to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Bridget John, and I will be facilitating the webinar today. Um, minor, minor compared to the great contributions of all of our panelists. Now, we are being hosted the webinar today by the International Association for Impact Assessment, or IAIA. And IAIA is the leading global network on best practice for using impact assessment for making better and more informed decisions. If you hear something today in our webinar that you want to share on social media, please feel free to do that. You can see on our screen our Twitter handle at IAIA Network, as well as a hashtag you could use, uh, hashtag IAIA Webinar. Before we get started, I do want to invite you all, if you have not already or have not recently, please do check out our website, IAIA.org. There are a lot of resources there for you to check out, including recordings on demand of our some of our past webinars. There's a wealth of topics on for our webinars. You see only just three listed there, emerging technologies related to biodiversity impact assessment, big city mega growth, uh, impact assessment practice in Latin America, which is in Spanish and available to II members. So the webinars that we have done in the past run the gamut of topics, health, resettlement, disasters and conflicts, uh, biodiversity. So please do visit our website and check those out. I also want to invite you to go to our website to uh, find out more about our annual conference. Our 2024 conference will be in Dublin, Ireland. So looking forward to seeing you there. We hope that you'll be interested and want to attend. Uh, the topic is impact assessment for a just transformation. And the deadline for submitting session proposals is next Monday, the 24th of July. And so if you have a topic that you think would be great to discuss with a bunch of great experts in impact assessment on the topic of, of just transformation or, or anything else related to impact assessment, please do visit our website and get your session proposal in before the deadline. There will also be an opportunity to submit paper submissions and abstracts later in the year. So keep an eye out on our website and on our e-news for those. In addition to webinars, IAI offers a variety of training. We have online training courses, which are our in-person training courses, but modified for a virtual setting. Uh, so this usually in four segments for a few hours each. And uh, our prestigious trainers have graciously converted their in-person courses for a virtual audience. We also have our professional development program, which is very popular. It's a three month kind of on your own uh, course that you can take some online videos and, and some and materials. But then the unique thing is you're paired one on one with a mentor as you go through that and you, you get to meet with them, talk with what you're with them about what you're learning. And so we've gotten a lot of great feedback and we have a new session starting in September. So visit our website and check that out. Um, the topic is foundations of impact assessment. And of course, if you check our resources tab on our website, you'll see a large number of free and downloadable publications. Whether you want something short and sweet, like our two-page fast tips, or something a little bit more involved, like best practice principles, our guidelines, and a variety of other documents, uh, please visit our website and check some of those things out. A few pieces of housekeeping before I turn it over to our presenters. Yes, we are recording this webinar. In a day or two, you will receive a link uh, with, by email to that recording. And you will also receive the slides. There are slides available now. You can download those if you click in your control panel for the, the handouts tab. It's a gray bar. You will you can download those slides right now, as well as bios for our presenters. But the link to that will also, you'll receive that when you receive the link to the recording. 
there will be a time for Q&A at the end of this webinar for the panel discussion, but please don't feel like you have to wait till the end to pose your question. You can go to the questions pane, it's a gray bar on your GoToWebinar control panel, and open that, and at any time, if you have a question throughout the webinar, someone triggers something that you wanna ask a question about, go ahead and pop that in there at that time. You feel free to wait, but don't feel like you have to. And so now I want to introduce our moderator uh, for today, who's going to be introducing the rest of our panelists. Our facilitator and moderator is Ariel Kushner. He is president of AMDA Consultants. He has a PhD and MS of ecology and is qualified. He's a qualified environmental and social specialist with 30 years in sustainable development and sustainable financing experience. His work experience spans across the countries in Latin America, the Caribbean, Asia, Africa, Southern Europe, and the Middle East. And along with Deborah Zanowicz, Ariel is also the co-chair of IAIA's Washington Area Branch. And we are so pleased that uh, our Washington Area Branch is co-organizing this panel for us today and, and grateful that they proposed this topic so that we could share it all with you. So Ariel, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um really very good present introduction to this uh, uh, presentation today. Uh, good morning to all of you. Um, in reality, this is a very exciting international event with participants from 51 countries. So for some of you it will be good evening and good morning to some. Uh, my name is Ariel Kushner uh, and together with Debra Zanowicz, we co-chair the IAA WAP region in Washington DC area and we are really happy to bring this online event to you. Uh, but before I move forward and we start with the presentation, I would personally like to thank uh, Laura Lee Fortuny and Brigitte John at the IAIA headquarters for providing truly valuable support to make this uh, today's event a reality. And of course, I'd like to thank to the multiple participants from around the world and the participating in this event. Uh, we know that the background of some of you, uh, we enjoy the presence of an audience with, uh, from ornithologists to representatives of the wind energy sector, representatives of international banks that finance projects in Argentina and other parts of the world, representatives of the scientific community, international NGOs, and many others. And to be honest, that was one of our main objectives for this event, not only to announce the activation of this important free online platform, but also to initiate a collaborative process for all interested parties to be able to contribute knowledge about these and other bird species and their interaction with wind farms in Patagonia, Argentina. Uh, we also would like to exchange useful information for the development of wind energy and the reduction of its impacts uh, in the area and to strengthen the sustainable growth of wind energy sector in Argentina. Uh, through today's event, you will have the opportunity to learn about this GeoPortal, a highly useful online tool developed by the organization Wetlands Argentina, uh, which will be speaking after me. The tool provides uh, valuable information to all involved in the development of wind energy in Patagonia region in Argentina and also in Chile as well as in the conservation of Patagonian bird species. Uh, within this uh, geo portal, you will also have access to a regional study of geese, uh, common names Cauquen in the region, a study in which uh, I was involved and carried out a couple of years ago, thanks to the support of the German bank, DG Invest or Impulse. Um, but the question is, how do we get to this moment? Uh, for many years now, several Argentinian ornithologists and academic centers, uh, various uh, provincial and national academic entities, as well as NGOs, have been carrying out very important biological and ecological studies on the country's avifauna in general and on the population of the cocaine species in particular, to these geese species that we're talking about today. In recent years, um, several wind energy companies active in Patagonia have joined this data collection effort. The involvement of the private sector was due primarily to two reasons. One, 
The environmental permits needed to build wind farms require biodiversity studies. Second, international lenders financing these projects had very strict requirements regarding protection of avifauna and impact reduction of their projects. As a consequence, many of those wind farm developers had to embark in a very important data collection effort guided, guided by international standards and also new guidelines in, this, in Argentina in this case. The outcome of this effort was an unprecedented stream of new data on the ecology and distribution of Patagonian birds. This included new in situ observation of cocaine species, uh, secondary information collected from various bibliographic sources, ass assessments of previously unstudied habitats and behavioral studies of these species. However, uh, much of this valuable information could not be shared for confidential reasons or it was scattered in various databases, sometimes not easily accessed to the public. Many of the risks to consider when assessing cocaine bear species in Patagonia had a common denomina denominator. The fact that in many cases, wind farms share the same airspace and habitats used by their populations, both in their nesting sites in the tip end of Patagonia and wintering places in the center of the country as well as in migratory paths across the region. Consequently, finding solutions and sharing this immense amount of data collected was a challenge that we had to overcome. The need arose to carry out the regional baseland data collection study for cocaine species that had the double objective of collecting regional information that can be used for the sustainable development of wind farms, um, and finding a data share mechanism, an online database, so that the general public can have free access to this information, which was previously limited, as I mentioned. The objective of the regional study was the creation of a regional Patagonian database that could be published with open access to the public and will contribute to a better understanding of ecological, reproductive, migratory, and behavioral elements of this Argentina Bifan. This knowledge can be used to help reduce impacts, particularly collision impacts in terms of uh, airspace or uh, impacts to habitats in terms of construction of the projects. Um, several international banks expressed their interest in sponsoring this effort, and ultimately it was the German bank DEG uh, Invest, today DEG Impulse, that responded very proactively, particularly through two efforts. First, the financing of their original regional bird study of birds that I mentioned earlier, and subsequently the project, the DG sponsored the creation of this geo portal, this online platform open to the public. It's important to emphasize that Wetlands Argentina not only helped develop the online geo portal, but also added an enormous amount of data that was collected by this organization, organization in the last few years. The portal is an interactive platform, so the intention is for the public to add and to be able to extract information from that online, online baseline. Uh, consequently, the GeoPortal will be of benefit to all. Uh, I would like, before I introduce the speakers, to thank many of the project developers, companies who shared information uh, collected in bird monitoring efforts. Among them, uh, Genea, Sociedad Anonima, Green Energy, the CAPSA Group, Total RN, and Petrochemical Commodore Rivadavia. Uh, I also want to thank numerous Argentinian ornithologists who offer the knowledge to better define the baseline. Among others, it's worth mentioning Daniel Blanco, and Gonzalo Daniel, Paula Petracci, and Evangelina Lastra, Gabriela Morga, Santiago Limberti, Paolo Grilli, and Daniel White. And I apologize for to many other experts who also offer their opinions, but the space is too small to mention them all here. Again, many thanks to the German Bank DEG for the support. I would like to introduce Char Charlotte Seidel, Senior Manager Sustainability for KFW DEG Impulse. Yeah, thank you, Ariel. Um, and good afternoon from Germany. Um, I'm really happy to be here today and to also um, say some words um, on behalf of the German Development Finance Institution, DEG. 
Um, my name is Charlotte Zittel. Um, I'm a senior environmental and social manager at DED, and it's really great to see the huge interest in this um, presentation today because it really shows again that um, the project hit a nerve. I like that. Um, maybe let me share my personal history with um, with you. Um, I have with this tool or this uh, geo portal. Um, when I started um, to work at DEG in 2018, I took over a wind farm project uh, in Argentina. And um, this project did not only comprise providing funding to the project developer, but also to fund a regional bird study on the endangered uh, goose um, Chloephaga. And um, I remember I was really thrilled um, about the idea that um, DEG um, does not only have the opportunity to provide financing, but also to support ideas and initiatives that go along with our clients' commercial activities. And now, five years later, um, we have this amazing interactive uh, geo portal with open access to the public, which improves decision making of governmental entities and project developers in Argentina. Um, and we all know that impacts on birds and bats is one of the most obvious environmental risks of wind farms. And yet biodiversity baseline uh, studies are often conducted after the site selection or are poorly designed or are simply not existent. And um, I have seen too many wind farm projects where um, sites were poorly selected and where project developers needed to um, implement costly and complex solutions to retrospectively heal or try to heal um, biodiversity damage that can hardly be healed. Um, and to finally comply with national and international standards. And in my view, um, this is a waste of time, energy and money, and it's way better invested at an early stage when selecting a site. And I also think that the idea of sharing uh, biodiversity data um, with um, other stakeholders um, is, is, is worth a lot because they can use them as well. And that should be done um, more often in my view. Um, we all know that renewable energy is not good per se. It can create negative impacts on the environment and it's our responsibility to avoid them as far as possible. Um, because not only stopping the climate crisis is key, but also protecting the biodiversity. And I'm really happy that the EG had the chance to support the development of the smart web tool that is presented today. I also want to thank everyone who has worked on this important project, especially Wetlands International and AMBA consultants, um, for their excellent work on realizing the platform. And I also thank the International Association for Impact Assessment for the opportunity to present this tool today. Furthermore, I want to thank all of you to have joined us today. Um, if you have any suggestions, if you want to collaborate, if you want to support, feel free um, to reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I would like to introduce now uh, Daniel Blanco, uh, Director for Woodlands uh, International in Argentina. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, hello, everybody. So I, I'm Daniel Blanco. I'm the director of the Wetlands International Latin American office based in Buenos Aires in Argentina. I am an ecologist with expertise and ornithologist also with expert, expertise on wetland management and also conservation of migratory water birds within South America. So thank you, Ariel, and I give the floor to Irene. Thank you, Daniel. Um, now I would like to introduce uh, Irene Fabricante. Irene is was responsible for the basically the technical aspect of implementing this portal, and she will give us uh, an overview of how the portal works and what the useful tools that you can find there. Yes, thank you, uh, Ariel, and hello, everybody. I'm Irene Fabricante. I'm a GIS uh, expert, so I collaborate with this project. 
Uh, and uh, I, I want uh, the English is not my uh, mother language, so I can try to do my best. Uh, thank you. That's okay. Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ariel. I will start with the presentation uh, to give an introduction, and then Irene will de describe the tool more in detail and all the technical aspects. So today we will present the Geoportal, the Cauquenes Migratorios, or Geoportal of Migratory Austral Geese. This is a tool uh, based on GIS, to support the conservation of these migratory geese, but also to support the decision making regarding the development of uh, wind farms in Argentina. Uh, while this tool was uh, developed for Argentina, it has the potential to be uh, expanded to other countries within South America and also to other parts of the world. But this project was a collaboration between uh, Wetlands International, the organization that I represent, and the consultant in, in the name of Ariel Kushner. Um, we have the, the key support for DEG uh, Impulse, the was very important for the, the development of this project. So the next one, uh, Irene, please. So first, we, I would like to introduce briefly who we are. Wetlands International is a, a non-profit organization, international organization dedicated to the conservation and restoration of wetlands all around the world. Uh, our mission is to inspire and, and mobilize society uh, to conserve and restore wetlands for people and nature. We are a science-based organization and we work in partner with the community, with the government and also with the private sector. Uh, we, what we bring to the table is our expertise in managing wetlands, water and biodiversity. And we, when we talk about wetland ecosystem, we talk about many ecosystem services that these uh, wetlands provide. And within these services, we have the biodiversity and if we talk about biodiversity one of the main prominent groups uh, that you could see when you visit the wetland area is what are water birds and within water bird, we, we have this special group of geese inhabiting the southern cone, southern cone of south america which are the austral geese that we will refer to today in the in this platform the next one irene please So we have, uh, as Wetlands International, as, as Ariel mentioned before, a long track record collecting data about water birds all around the world. The International Water Bird Census Program started in the uh, 1960s uh, in Europe and Africa and later was expanded to Asia and also Latin America. In South America, we started the Neotropical Water Bird Census in 1990 so we have more than 30 years of data collected and this data is very important to this kind of tool at the geoportal so in our last strategy to 2020 2030 we have a global target that is related to uh, improve the management management of around the half 50 percent of the this key or critical important size uh, for migratory water birds along flyways. So we are working within this uh, the target. And also we have a goal that is to, to work for the conservation some, of some uh, specific group of water birds, like the Australis. The next one. So going to the Australis uh, at wind farms, so we have a uh, have been working on Austral geese conservation and study uh, this group of water birds since early 90s in Argentina and Chile. The, we are talking about three main species that inhabit the southern cone of South America, mainly the Patagonia uh, region, the upland goose, the ashy-headed goose and the ruddy-headed goose. All these three species are migratory species and they overlap in their distribution. The main breeding areas uh, are in southern Patagonia and the Tierra del Fuego Iceland, 
while the wintering quarters are more north in northern Patagonia and also in the southern of uh, Buenos Aires province in the Pampas region. The three species migrate together in mixed flocks along Patagonia region. And what happened in the last year is with the promotion of alternative energies to fossil fuels and with the development of wind energy in Argentina and in Chile, numerous wind farm projects uh, began to, to be located along the, the flyway, the migratory corridor of these uh, austral geese. And what happened is wind turbines, if located along this corridor and close to the main stopover site and, and areas that are used by the geese during uh, the migration, this can pose a significant threat to this species. So this is why the, the tool, why would we need the tool? The next one, Irene, please. So to finalize my, my introduction, I would like to refer again to this project, the Geoportal of Migratory Austral Geese. Uh, and the aim of the goal of this tool is to facilitate the access to knowledge about the distribution and numbers of the, the three species of Austral Geese. So it could be using the decision-making decision processes when wind energy uh, development uh, and also regarding the location of the wind farm along the Patagonia in Argentina and Chile. The idea is to avoid or minimize the impacts to these uh, key groups. When we talk about this, this species, we need to remember that we have a, one of the three species is in critical uh, a situation of uh, conservation is, is endangered. So when as the three species migrate together, <clears throat> this pose a specific threat to the endangered species, which is the radical goose. So the idea and our, our interest is that this tool will be used for na national and provision uh, managers, also with the development of uh, developers from the wind farm sector by the consultants and NGO. The idea is to support the conservation of the group while also provide good information that could be used uh, to take decision about the wind development planning uh, in Argentina. So now we will give the floor to Irene, so Irene could uh, show us the, and explain the tool in detail. Thank you. Yes, so uh, we are going to take a tour in this uh, platform. So this is the geoportal and uh, what's a geoportal about? So uh, this is geographic information server. And uh, in this case, the, uh, this geoportal have focus in three species of Austral geese and wind farms. In this uh, server, we can find different kind of information. So we, we can find geographical uh, information uh, that we call layers, uh, and we can combine these uh, layers in uh, thematic maps. And also we can find uh, documents like papers, uh, good, uh, uh, good practice uh, guides, and different kinds of documents images, videos, and uh, we uh, can, uh, this geoportal uh, can have a communication tools like dashboards and um, geo stories. So uh, the advantage of the geoportal is that the uh, information are organized and centralized. So brings together all the all the information in one place, making it uh, making it easy to access and manage, uh, uh, and brings reliable uh, uh, reliable and accurate information because we work to publish a, a information with a high quality. Uh, facilitate collaboration and exchange the information because uh, uh, the users can contribute to construct and enrichment the, uh, the data. Um, the the geoportal have metadata available 
that the uh, metadata brings important information about the data. And um, uh, this tool um, have an interactivity because offers an, uh, 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 offers an interactive experience allow users to explore and visualize overlap data and create their own maps. So how is organized the information in the geo portal? We have uh, in one side the geo node that, that is the server. So we can found here the layers, the thematic maps, the documents and the communication tools. And uh, the geo portal have a map viewer that it's another easy uh, uh, friendly user tool. So how uh, you can, uh, can access uh, to the information in the GeoNode. Here are the data, the button for the maps to access to the maps, the communication tool, and here is the button to the viewer. And it's important to register in the platform uh, so this allow us to check uh, um, the users and how interested I uh, have this uh, tool. And here are our terms and conditions. So um, here we can found the layers uh, and this is the main data no, that uh, we collect. For example, uh, if we access to the to the, the layers, uh, this is an example. Uh, these are data uh, about abundance and uh, and sites of ruddy head goose. Uh, and here are uh, clicking here, you can consult the data and a map. Uh, uh, here you open a map. So. This is our the legend about the map, the information, and here you can uh, have uh, the data. Uh, this this uh, points are related with a database. So here you you can um, consult the database. If you click in one point of the of the map. Um, this um, uh, bring the info this point uh, you have you can access to the information uh, for this point no for example the coordinates the number of individuals found in this point the species the um, the season the year different uh, information about this data so um, it's important that this tool allow to overlap geographic information. So here you can add another layer. For example, we can add information about wind farms. So here you uh, it's display both information in, what, uh, in one map and you can store this map. And another important tool uh, is that uh, all the data have the metadata and the metadata provide information about data sources, methodologies, owner, a geographic project, project on system and details of the, the data. So at the moment we have information about we have data about austral geese, wind farms, and we have a context data like a conservation areas, wetlands that are very important, ecosystem for this species, and these are the sources from the, the data. An important uh, 
tool is that this uh, geoportal can connect with remote service that uh, are other geoportals in national uh, organism, for example, and uh, uh, we can add data for from from that uh, geo services. So in this in this example, we are going to add information for remote sense service. So here we can add, for example, information about electric power transmission lines from the, our national geographic servers service. Uh, so here are the documents. We can access to the documents, uh, good practice gu uh, guides, uh, papers about these species, wind farms, and these things. Uh, and the, here we you can go to the um, the viewer. So the viewer is a, an easy friendly interface that allows users to view and interact with the maps. So here uh, you can have all the layers, for, him, for example, seasonal abundance, uh, uh, maps of distribution, uh, data uh, data of migration, uh, wind farms, conservation areas, and another information. And in the viewer, uh, you can choose the the layer, the background. So here you can choose satellite, for example, satellite uh, background or uh, other background. So clicking this little eye, you can uh, turn on the layers that you need. For example, here we uh, turn on uh, abundance about uh, um, austral geese, distribution areas, and uh, wind farms. So we can overlap this information. And this is another example that when the background is uh, satellite images and we overlap wetland maps and the uh, uh, Austral geese uh, sites. So the next steps that we consider important to this tool is, uh, well, the geoportal is currently in development phase. So we uh, want to integrate a, count, a user counter resi and resuscitation fun um, functionality to enable efficient monitoring and tracking of user engagement. Uh, we want to in, uh, update data and incorporate data from Chile. And uh, we are going to develop sensitive maps. Where we consider this a very key layer. Uh, and the other next step is develop the communication tool like uh, your stories and dashboards. So thank you and go to GeoPortal. Thank you, Irene. Um, Daniel, um, I and Irene, I open the panel for, for uh, questions. Uh, we have one submitted at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, Daniel, I think you can ask, uh, answer this. Um, what is the maximum travel distance for this geese? Thank you, Ariel. Well, we know that uh, uh, the distance uh, could uh, reach uh, 800 kilometers per day, or th they could move between different uh, areas of, uh, for resting areas. Um, there is a lot of variation, but they could move really long distances in a day when going to 
a specific uh, area. Thank you, Daniel. Um, an additional question. Um, do we have information about um, most stepover sites uh, for this species? Okay, we'll take this one uh, also. So we have a lot of information for the breeding areas and also for the wintering areas in southern Buenos Aires province, but uh, still uh, the information about the stopover site is uh, scarce. So we, we know some, uh, we have information of uh, some points where the, the outer geese were located, but uh, we need more time to really study because they are not using uh, only few, few sites. They are moving and using different sites during migration. So it's a gap. I think that uh, we have an idea and, and a good idea about, and we know that they are migrating close to the coast the coast of uh, Patagonia, uh, not um, inland, but we still need more research uh, to really identify which are the main stopover sites of immigration. And this is because uh, Patagonia is an area that is not uh, very much populated and there are not so many ornithologists uh, living along Patagonia. So data is uh, still uh, scarce. Thank you, Daniel. Um, additional question is, uh, we know these three species of geese are different, not only in, in their some ecological characteristics, but also in their abundance. Um, just to mention, and you can des describe this a little bit more, is that uh, Cauquen, Colorado uh, is an endangered species. And I don't know what the existing numbers, estimated existing numbers are. Oh, well, the, the radicated goose is uh, a, a very endangered species. It is uh, the estimated uh, site of population of the mainland population uh, uh, migrating in, in, in the mainland South America is around 700 birds. Well, we have a separate population, um, it's really a separate subspecies uh, in Malvinas, uh, Falkland Islands. So in this case, uh, the population is in good the conservation condition, is around 40,000, but they, these are two different subspecies. And so the mainland subspecies that migrate in South America, mainland South America is very small population and is critically, critically endangered. Are we talking about uh, 2,000, 1,000, what's the number? 700, 700. 700. Yeah, it's about 1,000 in, in mainland South America. Okay. And of course, uh, the rabbit head goose is, is, is uh, mi uh, migrating together with the other two species that are more abundant. Also, they are uh, showing a decreasing trend in their population. So there is some kind of alert about uh, the potential, uh, pot potentiality that they will uh, be in danger in the future, but they are okay today. Thank you, Daniel. There is another question from the audience. Uh, do you have information regarding Clofaga species use of the airspace? How high do they fly? How frequently they fly at any given height? I have, uh, I have not this information particularly. And I don't know, Ariel, if you, if you would answer this question. Uh, at least from the from the studies uh, conducted for uh, uh, project financing, um, um, the species can fly in terms of their risk for collision with uh, uh, wind farms. Uh, they they do fly um, along the height of the rotors. Um, Interestingly enough, recent studies have shown that um, the species uh, does show some kind of uh, level of avoidance, uh, but we're still, uh, it's still unknown about the real impact of uh, the sector in, to this particular species. Um, there is another, there are many questions. I'll give you more. Um, um, Participants talk about, says, given that there are less than 700 individuals, the sex ratio may be important for the species survival. 
Is it even or approaching parity or are there deviations? And Daniel? No, I have not this information. We were not uh, studying this, uh, making this kind of study, but I'm sure the people working in the breeding area, because we used to work more in the winter in areas, but they are some experts working in southern Patagonia, in Chile mainly, and they could uh, have more information, more updated information about this. Thank you. So I look, what I could do is to look for this data and if if I could have the, the name of the person, I could try to send some information later that I could uh, investigate. Okay. And of course, uh, this data will be included in the portal uh, on time. Um, another question I have here from the participants is uh, which path they follow, including countries. Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, the distribution, geographic distribution, Daniel? Yeah, of course, the, the Chlorophylla group, the Austral geese, is an endemic group of South America. And from the five species, we have uh, three that are related to the mainland uh, uh, Patagonia and, and the southern cone of South America. Uh, they migrate between Argentina and Chile. So they are shared between the two countries and due to the is, is a shared species, we have an agreement in the framework of the uh, Convention of Migratory Species between Argentina and Chile, a signed agreement to, to work for the conservation of the radiated goods, for example. And we have another species that is coastal one, but also is restricted to Argentina and Chile, coastal Patagonia, more south. And we have a, a five, fifth species that is restricted to the high Andes. So it's a very, very endemic group of South, Southern South America. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, one element to mention is that um, uh, this, uh, the, the purpose of this portal is to expand to uh, the impact on other species. And why do I mention that? Is because um, the main impacts so far of uh, potential impact of uh, wind farms from these species reside on the impact on the airspace, they share the same airspace with these species. In some cases, very few cases, but some cases um, the species are impacted because of habitat alteration. Uh, but in terms of construction and operation of a wind farm, uh, the impact is primarily on the operation side for the species. Um, for other species, uh, the problem is <clears throat> habitat destruction. Um, so it's important to notice that the intention of this uh, portal is to expand knowledge not only on other aspects, including some of the topics discussing these questions by participants, uh, but also other species um, in the area. And the already existing data in the portal, including the layers, um, offers an opportunity to understand um, what are the best options in terms of um, uh, locating a project in a particular area or not? Um, one more thing I would like to say before I uh, give you the word again, Danielle, is um, as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, I was involved in this for the last uh, six years, I think. Um, but I, now I will be probably passing the baton to you and to Wetlands Argentina. Uh, so I call to participants in this uh, presentation and others to get involved with this project, uh, to help Daniela and Irene uh, continue this effort, this important effort, and to um, support in any way you can. Uh, Daniel, I don't know if you want to have, uh, do you have any other questions or other things that you want to mention? No, just a comment about what you mentioned to, to the that we have the ambition to, to grow the platform and to include other species because Australia is one of the of the groups of water birds migrating along Patagonia and, and which are threat but uh, um, a non well planned uh, development of wind farms. But also there are other groups of uh, migratory shorebirds and that migrate all along the continent from the tundra, the, the northern 
North America to Southern Patagonia to Tierra del Fuego, they do it this along the coast. And they also could be a group that is also threat by the wind farm. So we need to, to expand the tool in the future and, and include other species that could be affected by the, the issue. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I do not see any additional questions. I would like to, I don't know if Charlotte is still in the conversation. To thank her again uh, for their support, for the DEG support uh, for this portal and the previous studies. Um, and uh, there, here she is. Um, and um, and once again to invite anybody that, of the participants here. We didn't want to expand in too many details, technical details on the portal itself. It's a very uh, friendly in terms of interaction. Uh, there are many things that you will be able to discover by yourself, uh, just playing around with the tools. Uh, but if you have any questions or you want to get involved with more directly with the project, uh, please uh, contact uh, Wetlands Argentina and, um, and we'll be happy to collaborate with you. Um, Charlotte, I don't know if you want to close the event with some words of wisdom. <laughs> Um, of course. Uh, no, I want to thank you again, Ariel, especially. You have, have been doing a great job for the past six years, as you say. Thanks a lot for bringing that forward for such a long period. Yeah, and I wish you um, all the best for the continuing with this platform. DEG is, of course, happy to have been supporting this. And um, we can, of course, also keep touch um, how we can support in the future. But maybe there are also other stakeholders who want to jump in and be part of the this great initiative thank you thank you uh, thank you to all the participants thank you to iaia for organizing this event and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch thank you thank you okay thank you everyone so much for a great uh, panel discussion and a presentation and I just want to share with you and let me just show my screen here um, our upcoming webinars and we do have some upcoming ones uh, one in particular there's more coming haven't been advertised yet but there's on our think big 2050 city mega growth and the registration is open for that live panel which will take place August 1st but you will find on our website that there are two there there's one pre-recorded panel already up there and there will be another one launched on Friday uh, and so you'll be able to view those in advance. And some of those panelists, presenters will be gathered together as a panel on August 1st. So you can listen and watch their presentations and then uh, really dig in uh, in greater depth with some of their information there. Now, I just want to thank uh, our panelists for taking the time to put together such a great and informative presentation today. Thank you, Ariel and Deborah, as well as co-chairs of the Washington area branch and all the work that you do, not just to bring great topics to the impact assessment public through your branch activities and working with IAI, but all that you do to work with uh, impact assessment professionals in the Washington area as well. So let's keep talking about this. So if you have some um, additional information or tidbits that you thought were great, um, please feel free to share them online. You can see our, our social handles and hashtag there. IAI members, feel free to post something in IAI Connect in our online community. I do want to say that uh, in a day or two, just to remind you that you will be receiving a link to both the recording and the slides. And as you leave here today, you will also receive a, a brief survey. And we just ask that you take a few quick minutes to fill that out. It also includes a question about topics that you would like to see for future webinars. So if there's something that you really want to know about, let us know so that we can find the experts and, and get that information out to you. Uh, th a final thanks to you as participants for taking your time and spending it with us today. We know that your time is valuable. We hope that you found this to be valuable as well. 
Thanks, everyone. Have a great day and see you next time.